Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Lynda.com. Lynda.com is an easy and affordable way to help you learn. Instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on business, software, web development, graphic design, and more. For a free trial, visit lynda.com slash knowhow. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash knowhow. And by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy with free step-by-step repair guides, high-quality replacement parts, and all the tools that you'll ever need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to ifixit.com slash twit and enter the code knowhow at checkout. On this episode of Know How, your feedback, we're going to talk a little bit about soldering bullets and then quadcopter avionics. It's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballos here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next 50 or so minutes, we're going to take you through some of the projects that we've been working on so that you could take them home and geek out yourself. Absolutely. And uh, this week, we're talking about pollution. Yeah, you know, pollution, I think we all can, all can agree, pollution's bad. Yeah. No matter bad. where you stand on the whole global warming thing, <laughs> right. it's not good to breathe in soot. Yeah, that's generally not advised. <laughs> <laughs> now, there, there is a type of particle, a particulate, that mm. uh, the World Health Organization thinks is the most dangerous, and that's the 2.5 uh, PM particulate matter. And that's because it's small enough that you can inhale it and then it will get absorbed into your bloodstream. Yeah, that sounds terrifying. That sounds horrible. Right, exactly. Ooh. Imagine what's in the air of a modern city and then shoot that up into a vein, basically. Uh -huh. that's and this is something people have to deal with every day. Every day, right. Uh, but there's one place in the world where that's it's the worst. It's the worst, and yeah. that's China. It's yeah. specific, you know, near Beijing. The World Health Organization says that for 2.5 p.m., you can have a concentration no greater than 25 micrograms per cubic meter. Okay. Okay. So at 25, that's not good for you, but it, it won't have adverse health effects. Unfortunately, in Beijing, most days it's about 525. Oh man. Yeah, that's, that's not, frightening. It is kind of frightening, and it actually it's uh, there's there's been a couple of student activist groups who are pushing for more openness. Like for example, there was a there was a climate summit that was in Beijing just last week. Mm -hmm. And what they did was the Beijing government shut down all the sensors so that people couldn't <laughs> check to see how bad it was because they didn't want to look bad. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and ignoring it will make it go away. Exactly, right? Yeah. I mean, people don't if people can't check it on their, their cell phone. <laughs> they, they won't go, they won't oh, know. what's wrong with this air? Why do oh. I feel so sick? Yeah, Is that horrible. fog? Yeah, the cough. <laughs> oh, I coughed up a lung. Wow. Ooh. Now, there are students at mm -hmm. UC Berkeley led by a, a man by the name of David Liu, mm -hmm. born in Shanghai, uh, has, is an international student at uh, UC Berkeley, and he's decided to create a small device that can actually measure pollution. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the cool thing about this is it's it's a, like a pendant size. It's about the size of a necklace. It uh, it's inexpensive. They're talking about fifty to seventy-five dollars per unit. You can automatically check your uh, air quality on your smartphone. So it will sync up with your smartphone. So you'll be able to find out. The, uh, the nit nitrogen content, uh, content, so like nitrogen dioxide, it will do chemical an analysis for that. It will take a look at ammonia, and most importantly, the sensors can actually count particulates. Hmm. Yeah. That's so pretty cool. It takes a little puff of air every once in a while, runs it to the sensors, and it will tell you, hey, uh, and it can look for those that PM 2.5. Right. It can tell you there's 2 micrograms, or there's 5,000 micrograms run. But, okay, so if you have this device and it detects that it's very bad pollution around you, what do you do then? Well, like, I mean, that's, it, I mean, look, it's, it's not like it creates like, a force shield. It's not <laughs> right, sucking it in and I giving want. you... Or like walk around in an astronaut suit or something. I have seen those people who walk around with those collar locked uh, HEPA filters, so it just blows clean air in their face. That's, well, there was also that story of the guy who was selling cans of air 
<laughs> I guess you could do that. No, That's but like, well, this is really more of an educational thing. So mm -hmm. I mean, of course, it's not going to help you if if you're walking through pollution. Your right. phone says, "Oh, by the way, this is unhealthy." <laughs> it's like, yeah, I probably already knew I that. I probably yeah. knew that. <laughs> but what they're hoping is because these can be linked through your smartphones mm -hmm. to the internet, you can essentially crowdsource pollution monitoring. Hmm. Oh, and then yeah, uh, maybe make a map and see where the most pollution is. Exactly. Maybe pinpoint some of the the biggest contributors to it. I right, and then what you can do is, if you have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of pollution mm -hmm. monitors, rather than just a dozen or two dozen set sensors, you can see it at street level, you can see it in buildings, hmm. you can see it you know, pretty much anywhere. And like you said, you can make a map of pollution rather than saying, oh yeah, it's a bad quality day. You could right. say, it's really bad on Mission and 14th. Right. Let's see what businesses on Mission and 14th might be dumping stuff into the air. Yeah, let's avoid that area for the time being, right. you know, kind yeah. of thing. Okay. It's, it's a cool okay. idea. And it, it takes this whole crowdsourcing thing to the next level. Yeah, I like that idea of the network of, uh, of things working together. But uh, also, it's like if you're in one position and you look out the window, you're like, OK, yeah, obviously the pollution is really bad here, <laughs> but I need to go get lunch. So where could I go that doesn't have you know all the particulates yeah. killing me? Yeah. So. <laughs> and, and we actually looked at something not too long ago as a banter item a couple of months back. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember that little, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the, the name of it. The, the, the weather something globe? sky. Yeah, the weather globe. Um, yeah, something say, sky, Skynet. something sky, sky. Tony. Yeah, Tony. We actually just set it up again on the roof. Yeah, yeah. Um, I forget what it was called. It, it's the same thing. It's it's crowdsourced weather monitoring. Mm -hmm. So it looks at the sky. It looks at temperature, humidity. So you can see those microclimates. Right, yeah. right. So micro pollution climates. As we move to an Internet of Things, I think that's going to be one of those things. Yeah, totally. I, I like that idea. And uh, they're all working together and. and Hopefully, coming up with a solution eventually. <laughs> I, I hope so because I'm tired of breathing in nasty air. <laughs> right. well, yeah. Exactly like that. <laughs> Cans of air. Oh, uh, thank you, President Screw. That's that's the solution. <laughs> you need clean water. You need clean air. Just put it in a can and then yeah. don't worry about it. Clean water, clean air, and how about this? Clean ideas. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> ideas in a can. In your, well, no, I'm thinking more of ideas on a website. Oh, that helps too. Yeah. 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 Oh, been, like a collection. Of like ideas? a collection of ideas. <laughs> I think I know where you're going with this. Where? Lynda.com. That's right, mm -hmm. Lynda.com. Now, Lynda.com is your one-stop shop, your repository on the internet for knowledge. We like to say that everyone has a knowledge hole. This yeah. is a good thing. You want a knowledge hole, but you need to have something to pour in to the knowledge hole. Yeah. That's what Lynda.com helps you do. <laughs> Fill it's your like knowledge hole. It's like a bucket hole. that you use. It's like a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> now, Lynda.com is an easy and affordable way that, to help you learn. You can instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on software, web development, graphic design, and more. Alinda.com works directly with industry experts and software companies to provide timely training, often the same day that new versions or releases hit the market, so that you're always up to speed. All courses are produced at the highest quality. These aren't those homemade YouTube videos, which are great. I mean, that's where I came from. That's what I like to do. But sometimes you just want to pay attention to the material, not bad lighting or, or bad audio, not shaky production values. Lynda.com gives you good production so you can focus on the information at hand. They include tools like searchable transcripts, playlists, and certificates of course completion, which you can publish to your LinkedIn profile. And whether you're a beginner or advanced, Lynda.com has courses for all experience levels. You can learn while you're on the go with the Lynda.com app for iOS and Android. And one low monthly price of $25 gives you unlimited access to over 100,000 video tutorials. Premium plan members can also download project files and practice along with the instructor. And premium members with an annual plan can download courses to watch offline, which means it becomes your ultimate offline resource. No matter where you are, you can always have the material to help you figure out how to use Premiere or, or how to mount a, a camera on a, on a quadcopter. Essentially, the, the, the information that you need is always at your fingertips with lynda.com. Now, we've been doing a lot of work with, uh, with the new Creative Suite, right? Yes. I mean, we're yes. moving over to it. We've, we're dumping Final Cut. And we're saying, look, we're going to go with one thing that does photos and videos. Right. Well, we've been using lynda.com to, to brush up. Right. On, on all those things. Because I've known all the basics, but you know, now that we're using it day to day or soon to be using it day to day, I needed to learn up on all the hotkeys and everything like that. And exactly. And, and that's what one of the things that lynda.com is so good at, which is it's not just where you go to learn new stuff. And brush up on stuff. Brush up on stuff. Yeah. Or, or just to you know, make the connection between the things you did in Final Cut and the things mm -hmm. that you do in Premiere. It's, it's really something that's going to help you improve no matter what you're doing. 
be it business, be it software, be it video production, lynda.com has something for you. Now, their new courses include After Effects tips and techniques, com uh, compositing and effects, writing for the web, Google AdWords essential training, and Excel data mining fundamentals. For any software you rely on, lynda.com can help you stay current with all software updates and learn the ins and outs to be more efficient and productive. And we've got a special offer just for you. You get to access all the courses free for 10 days. Visit lynda.com slash knowhow to try lynda.com free for 10 days. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash knowhow. L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash knowhow. And we thank Linda for their support of knowhow. Let's get into some feedback. <laughs> Dive deep into the, the feedback. This is actually yeah. one of the segments I, I enjoy the most because yeah. we get to take the questions and the queries and the projects from our audience right. and put them on the show. Yeah, because there's... I mean, we've probably we've both gone through this ourselves yeah. most of the time, but yeah. then it's nice to go through the feedback and find out what what people are are wondering. Like, well, it's like, oh, we've already done that. We've got ideas for you. Let's kick it off. All right. So the first one was from Austin Clark, and he's looking for a, a laptop. Uh, he's upgrading an aging laptop, and it's Windows. It's his workhorse. He's using it for Photoshop and Lightroom. Some of the basic things he's looking to do. Uh, or with oh sorry <laughs> he's he's got a 14 to 15 inch screen which is pretty tiny for that kind of stuff yep. he's got an i7 he wants 8 gigs of ram an ssd a backlit cube keyboard touchscreen is optional um he would like to have a digitizer with a stylus but it seems to be impossible for that sort of thing and he was also maybe if he can't get that get a, a wacom pad which we've played with and those work really well uh but since he'll be editing photos he also wants a high resolution screen uh, and yeah, he'll definitely want something 27 inches or bigger, especially and 4K if he's going to be doing that sort of stuff. So we have a couple of recommendations for that. Yeah, and actually, he is in one of the professions, the few professions that I would say a 4K monitor actually makes, makes a sense. Yeah, most of the time, 4K monitors are nice, but like on 17 inches and below, you can't really tell the difference between right. 1080p and 4K, and unless you've got like a 30. Five inch monitor above, you can't tell the difference between 4K and 2K. Right. Yeah. But if you are a a photo professional, and if that's what you do most of the time, your 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 source material will regularly be 4K or or above, and so it does make sense to have that extra resolution. It does, and when it's on a bigger monitor, it helps a lot, especially when you're looking at photos or zooming in on photos, and you know changing the colors and the contrast and things like that. It it makes a big difference. Right. But. Uh, now I, I know that uh, he he's been doing some research on his own. If you look at the the actual comments, and mm -hmm. there are a few people who were uh, suggesting an ASUS notebook, and ASUS is very good. I, mm -hmm. I, I like their stuff. Uh, Dell, actually, the Dell 4800, the Precision 4800M, is a decent one. It's going to give you an i7 processor. It's going to give you, I believe, eight gigabytes of memory. Mm -hmm. You get it with an SSD. It's got a 15.6 inch screen. Uh, very nice. Uh, a little bit little bit over his price range. He was looking for something between 1300 and 1600 uh, th That particular configuration is probably going to run somewhere like $1,800, $1,900. Yeah. This is my personal favorite right now. I, I actually haven't even finished the review on this. I'm doing this for Before You Buy. This is the, uh, the new Acer Hotness. This is their uh, gaming yeah. notebook. This is a V15 Nitro Black edition. Uh, now, it doesn't have a touchscreen, which actually is fine on a gaming notebook. I mean, you, you don't yeah. buy this for gaming. But it's got a 15.6-inch screen. It's got an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 860M, which is great if you're going to be doing video editing uh, because it's going to help Have with the, the, the rendering. Right? Yeah. Uh, it's got uh, a 16 gigabytes of memory. It's got an Intel i7-4710HQ. Mm -hmm. That's a 2.5 gigahertz CPU with 6 megabytes of cache. It's, it's got nice. a 256 gigabyte SSD plus and a, one terabyte? a one terabyte rotating, which is oh. nice. I mean, if you're a creative professional, you want that because it means you get the speed plus the capacity. For $1,300. It starts at $1,300. Now, this one is slightly different. Because hmm. this one actually comes with a 4K screen. Yes, and we were playing around with that earlier. I was watching Greg uh, watch 4K videos on it. And from a distance, I couldn't say if it was 4K or 1080. Yeah, it's like, kinda, it looked really sharp. It's but. super sharp. Uh, yeah, for, for videos that are coming in, I mean, because it's you, you have a lot of moving pixels, yeah. it's hard to see the difference. But when you do photo editing, you actually do see the difference. Yeah, yeah. And because the, 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 the larger uh, dot count... The, the, the smaller space between pixels 
it actually does show off more detail when you're when you're like really zoomed in on something. Yeah, the color spectrum on it is really nice too. Yeah, that's the other thing. This what I like about this, and I think this is what he'd like about the the Nitro series is uh, a lot of notebooks they explode the color right because it's super saturated it pops right, and you want to super saturate it. This doesn't. This is a matte screen, uh, so you're not going to get that false uh, saturation of color, which. Uh, you know, a lot of notebooks won't do. So that matte screen will actually give you better color reproduction so that the final output that you do That's really is, nice. is actually going to look right. Hmm. Yeah. I like this. Now, and I, the view angle on it is pretty good, too. Yeah. This is actually not out yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Which means the pricing's not out yet. Uh, uh, but, I mean, if, if, the, if the, uh, the 1080p version was about $1,300, right. street price near $1,200, this is probably going to add four hundred dollars to that. That makes sense. Yeah. But you, so you could get the lower resolution one, and then maybe get an, another monitor that you would hook up to it. Right. And right. then it's, and you were saying it's not a touch screen, so you could maybe just get like a Wacom. A Wacom. I'd get it. Yeah. And, and and you know what he was saying is he'd like to have a a, uh, a notebook with an active digitizer. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any notebook of any decent mainstream notebook that has an active digitizer. I I'm sure there's one the out yoga. the Surface. Or the Surface. You can get the Surface, that'll do it. But, I mean, if you want a powerhouse laptop, it's going to be hard to find that. Yeah, there's a lot of compromises when it comes to that. Yeah. So I would I would stay focused with the hardware and, you know, subtract the, the digitizer and just get something additional for that. Yeah. But, I mean, options. Uh, the uh, the Asus is pretty good. The, the, the uh, Dell is pretty good. Toshiba's W50, if you can replace mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the hard drive with an SSD, is actually pretty good. Uh, no I, Mac recommendations there, Padre? For $1,300? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just don't. I, just, I, I, I mean, I agree. some Macs would be great. The new 5K iMac would be fantastic, uh, but it's going to be way out of his price range. Right, and I think he did say he wanted to focus on Windows, so... Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So, there you go. All right. All cool. right. So uh, there you go. That's that's the notebook you should take a look at. Uh, we've got another one here talking about batteries. Right. So this one comes from Bastian Kade. <laughs> How would you say that? Bastian Kade. 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 You know what? We're going to call you Boston. Hey, we're going to BC. There you go. BC. Shout out to BC. All right. All right. So he, he was asking about our last show where we were talking about batteries, and we, we haven't really mentioned the lifetime of some of these batteries we've been using for our, uh, our drone projects. And he was saying battery or cell lifetime distribution or a lifetime cycle, life under severe and mild usage, battery drain would not use at all, battery discharge would not use, battery long-term storage for minimum damage, and longer lifetime for minimum discharge while stored. So how are LiPo batteries we use for our quadcopter different from the low ion batteries uh, or other batteries. Yeah. Uh, well, this is actually a segment we were going to get to in the second arc of the quadcopter yeah. because it's a Hold bit more advanced. Hold your horses. We yeah, <laughs> yeah, relax, man. Relax. No, no. But, but no, I'm, I'm glad that you asked because we we'll still will talk about it. Lip lipo chemistry Lithium is actually... Lithium poly. Lithium polymer. And remember, one of the differences that we, we spelled out in the episode where we talked specifically about the batteries is unlike lithium ion batteries that you might find in some consumer applications, mm -hmm. this isn't a bag. It's literally a mylar. It's a plastic bag that's that's holding the chemistry, rather than a solid cylindrical cell. Oh, okay. Right, and it's got a stabilizing agent to make it so that it doesn't leak all over the place. And right, but if it gets pierced, if it gets pierced, it's going to burn. Okay. Yeah. So don't don't do don't, that, <laughs> or don't, don't fly do your that. drone into a building <laughs> with such an impact force. I only study. did that once. Okay, <laughs> leave me alone. I did. That, I did kill a battery that way. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a good learning experience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, uh, uh, as to the other parts of your questions, we did address. A lot of that. For example, yeah. the the cycles. This is a typical lithium ion battery. It's a lithium and polymer battery. So you're going to get about 500 to 600. I, I call it 500. It's, they say like a thousand, mm -hmm. but it's really realistically 500 cycles if you charge it at 1C. And remember, we talked about the formula for what that means. Right. So this is a 1,000 milliamp battery, which means 1C charge would be charging it at one amp, mm -hmm. one amp per hour. Right. Now, if you run it at its maximum charge rate, for example, the big battery pack, the 2200 I have, mm -hmm. has a maximum charge rate of 8C, which means I could, or 4C, which means I could charge that at 8 amps per hour. I could do that, and it would charge a lot faster, but I go down from about 500 cycles 
to like 50 cycles. Wow, okay. Right, yeah. so the more power you dump into it more quickly, the more the chemistry is going to destabilize, which means the battery will puff up or it will just, it will no longer hold the charge much, much sooner in its hmm. life cycle. Is it important to trickle charge these batteries? Too? I, I do. Um, my rule of thumb is, I mean, I have a lot of uh, batteries, so I don't ever need to get a pack, charge it up right away. Right. So I typically charge them at 1C all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, just, it prolongs the life of the pack, and it also means you're going to get a pack that has an SOC, the state of charge, that is more balanced across the cells. So this is three cells inside of here. Mm -hmm. My max charge is 4.2 volts per cell. If I fast charge it, I might get one cell at 4.2, I might get one cell at 4.15, and one cell at 4.07. Hmm. If I balance charge this at 1C, they're all gonna end up at like 4.2, 4.19. Okay. Yeah, so I get more power into the pack. So are these batteries that we're using for the larger quadcopters much different than the ones that we're using for our, our trainer quadcopters? Uh, no. Uh, they're, they're actually the same materials the same. and everything. A quality will differ. Because that's the, what I'm wondering about. Because I, when I bought my quadcopter, it came with a 500 milliamp, mm -hmm. and that one seems to be have the same yeah. level of charge each time. But I've also been using one of the 650s that you yeah. bought. I forget where you got it, but it doesn't seem to hold the same level of charge, and each time it seems to be getting a little bit worse. Yeah, just like most things in the consumer world, uh, you can buy cheap or you can buy good, mm -hmm. and sometimes we buy cheap. And oh. some of those are just cheap. They're not just not very good. They're not well made. The chemistry was probably contaminated when it went in, so you get weird results from time to time. They are very tiny batteries, and they yeah, are very, very cheap. So I guess, I mean, in the end, it probably only was a probably three or four dollars that we spent on it. Right. Because I think you can buy a five pack for 18. Yeah. For, so. <laughs> our, our thing was, well, so what if two or three are bad? I'm buying 10 for the price of one. So right. That, yeah. Okay. We okay. probably shouldn't have done that, but we did. Uh, now, the other question he asked was about discharge because mm. batteries will discharge over time. And LiPo packs are no exception to that rule. Right. Uh, but here's, and we're gonna talk about this when we talk about storing packs because for example, when we get into January and February, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to be flying your quad as much as you were during the summer because it's wet it's, weather. the weather's not, you don't want to fly it in the rain. You don't want to fly it in the snow. Waterproof our quadcopters. We could can do we that. we just tie some, a plastic bag over it and leave the <laughs> propellers exposed? <laughs> Actually, we'll, we'll try that. Uh, but, but when you store it, remember mm -hmm. this, the more voltage that's in the pack, the more voltage that will leak and the more chances are that you're going to damage the pack. Hmm. The, the maximum voltage for a pack is 4.2 volts. The minimum uh, voltage for a pack is 3 volts. If you go below 3 volts or above 4.2 volts, that's extremely bad. But when you're storing it, you want to store it at 3.85 volts. That is the optimal voltage to store a pack. The reason is this. If you store it at uh, 4.2 pack, you're going to lose about 2 to 4% of the charge every month. Hmm. It's just, it's just going to leak out. And that charge is actually damaging the insulation inside the pack, which decreases the life of the pack. If you store it at 3.85 volts, which is 50% capacity, you're going to lose about 0.2 to, to maybe 0.5%. So that's the optimum amount of power that you want to keep. Right. I, I, could, I could cold store these things for a year or two right. at that voltage and not worry about damaging the pack. So that, there you go. Cool, cool. Yeah, I do remember Steve Gibson and Leo talking about it for a pretty good period of time because they were talking about cell phones and laptops. And yeah. if you were going to store one for a long period of time, that you would want to keep the battery at 50% and then not don't charge it all the way, don't bring it all the way to the, down to the bottom. Right. Which, also, okay, so that's the next question I have is what about if you discharge all the way to zero and then recharge to 100%? Uh, like, okay, if you discharge a lithium polymer battery to zero, it will no longer work. Oh. It is gone. It's don't, don't even. Is it possible to then? Uh, you could you? Yes. Uh, you In normal 50 50 chance of, of it blowing up. Cool. What, yeah, but, you, okay, so what if you, I mean, you're flying your quadcopter actually, no, uh, and you get lithium it. Lithium polymer, if you go to zero volts, mm -hmm. like literally zero volts, <laughs> the battery's gone. It's never, it's never coming back. You've destroyed the chemistry. It, it means right. you have literally broken down the insulation in the battery pack. It will no longer hold the charge. But that would, you would purposefully have to do that. You right? would really yeah. try hard to make that happen. Now, here's something that, uh, I, I'm going to show this tip. But before I show the tip in a future episode, mm -hmm. I, I want to say now and I will say then, if you do this, 
have a fire extinguisher handy? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like most of the things that we do on this show, we have a fire extinguisher handy. The intelligent chargers will know if the battery pack dips below three volts and it will actually cut it. It will say under volt and it will not charge it because it knows that it's, it's dangerous. dangerous. Oh. What you can do, like on the charger that we have, you can switch from lithium ion to nickel metal hydride, which doesn't have that limitation, and like put 30 seconds of charge into it just to get it over three volts. And then start trying to charge it And again? then charge it. Is and that, that to works. save a battery? Then? It's to save a battery pack. It is exceptionally dangerous. I would just buy a new battery. I would just buy a new <laughs> Nine dollar battery to... pack. How expensive is your house? <laughs> just... I like knowing that you can do that, but I don't think I'd try it. <laughs> yeah, there's there's like a lot of videos on YouTube that show you how to do that, and I'm yeah. like, um, mm. no. precautions, precautions. Yeah. And they all say the same thing, which is, don't do this. <laughs> like, well, then why are you doing it? Stop. For the science. <laughs> For okay. the science. Uh, so we have <sighs> some more stuff coming up here, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Calibrating an ESC. So this is from Will O'Meara, and he has asked, my roommate and I are working on, a building, on building a car that will serve as a test bed for various control theory situations. We are using an Arduino, cool, as the brains, and we will load the control system onto. One such situation is a turbine drive slash friction drive hybrid system. I cannot get the turbine ESC to arm using the Arduino. I know that with Arduinos, ESCs can be treated as servos, but the arming procedure involves going full throttle, then back to zero several times and waiting for the beeps. I can only get the first beep to happen, but then nothing when I go full throttle. How do I arm an ESC with an Arduino? A yeah. uh, little bit confusing. I think we're, we're having different term terminology, so I'm going to take a stab based on what I think he's asking for. Mm -hmm. ESCs, it's an electronic speed controller. So like this, this is an ESC. If you go to the, uh, the extreme close-up overhead, uh, this is what an ESC looks like. This is uh, my personal favorite. This is a 30 amp from uh, readytoflyquads.com. Uh, by the way, Paul Baxter over at readytoflyquads.com, fantastic. I mean, uh, the, he's got probably the best hardware on the internet. Oh, yeah. Uh, probably the best prices on the internet, and he's just a really good guy. He will actually answer your questions. When yeah. you come to him, you're like, hey, am I going to destroy my house if I do this? But so this is what an ESC looks like. And the whole idea is, and we'll talk about this when we get to the avionics uh, uh, segment, is you have a control lead. And the control lead allows you to control how much power goes from the battery to the motors. Right. Right. And that's what an ESC does. It's an electronic speed control. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what, what, what I've done here is I've I'm, I'm set up something to show him how we calibrate an ESC. That's normally what requir requires full throttle. When right. you get an ESC out of the box, it doesn't really know what is the low voltage and the high voltage. So you have to set the parameters for it? Right. So most ESCs, in fact, I'll say every ESC uses the same procedure, which is you plug it in, you power it while the, while the transmitter is at full throttle, mm -hmm. wait for the beep, and then you pull it back to this low throttle, wait for the beep. And, and now it knows okay. that's 0%, that's 100%. I'm good. Makes right? sense. So this is how it works. If you go to the, the wide uh, overhead, uh, so I've got this receiver, which is bound to this transmitter, is tied to this motor and this power lead. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on my transmitter. And I'm going to set it for full throttle. Now I'm going to take a battery, and I'm going to go ahead and plug it in so that it powers up. You hear the little beep? I'm hearing a beep. It's beep. powering up the ESC, and that, now, that little beep you heard at the end of bump, yeah. That means it just measured all the full throttle. And if I bring this down, you'll hear it again. Let me get close. There we go. Beep, beep, beep. Yeah, so now it means it's calibrated. So it understands that's zero throttle. This is 100 throttle. That's cool. So that calibrates your ESC. Now, you could do this one at a time. Uh, one of the other things that I got over from Ready to Fly Quads <laughs> is this thing. Uh, go to the extreme close-up. This is a, a four to one. So this will allow me to plug in all four of my ESCs at once and yeah. then plug this into my receiver so I can calibrate all of them at the same time. I like that idea also because then there you know that they're all set to the same. Yeah. Uh, there's no chance that one, you you didn't actually put the throttle to 100% <laughs> on one of them and you made a mistake. Yeah, yeah. Well, which is why you do it because you remember you're, these are all providing the carrying thrust, right? right? So if one of them thinks 100% is a different level, slightly uh, it's different, it's gonna yeah. just keep dipping, yeah. right? And you'll just drive yourself insane. Yeah. And it, you'll probably crash it, and uh, you'll break you a propeller, it. and Absolutely you'll be sad, crash. like yeah. when we went out to fly them outside. Don't yeah. talk about that. <laughs>
I thought you were never going to talk about that again. Uh, so many broken propellers. Yeah. Now, it is slightly different with Arduino, but what I would mm -hmm. suggest is uh, buy yourself, if you don't have one, get a cheap transmitter, something like this with a receiver so that you can very easily set the calibration point on your, uh, on your, your machine. How much is that transmitter again? It's, it's like a $54 transmitter. And it looks serious. Like, that looks like a, this a will, cool controller. Yeah, this is, I beat this thing up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> what haven't you, that you own have you not beaten I know, up? it's yeah. like a, you, things get tested. Yeah, yeah, okay. go ahead. Right. Stress test. Yeah. Let's move on. I think we have one more. One more, and this one's cloud backup. So okay. we're, we're moving all around here. And this is from Adam L. DeSiri. Durissi. That works, sir. <laughs> what is a good online backup service slash company? I have a Linux, Windows, and Mac boxes. I'm looking to backup. I like Backblaze, but I do not offer anything on Linux. CrashPlan offers a version for Linux, but for some reason it won't work on my Ubuntu box. Needs to support all three, unlimited bandwidth, and around $5 a month or $60 a year. Yeah. So that's pretty broad. It's pretty broad. Uh, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. You can get a decent way to sync up data from a Linux box to the cloud. Mm -hmm. You're going to pay too much, it's going to be a little wonky, and you're not going to like the result. Hmm. What you could do, yeah. instead of paying $60 a year for something, blah, 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 uh -huh. get a really, really cheap Windows box, like bare bones Windows box, mm -hmm. and then you do the super backup solution that we showed off with the like Amazon Glacier. Ago. Right. Well, I, you know, or, I wouldn't even say Amazon Glacier. Go with SkyDrive, go with Skydrive. Dropbox. Uh, but what you do is you basically turn that into the, the sync point for all your data. It gets synced into that machine, and that machine pushes yeah. it out to the web. That would be a good way to do it's, it. It's a decent way to do it. I, and, you know, I, I don't like doing this because I know Linux people, you're not going to want to use a Windows box. I, I get that. I understand that. But just think of it this way. Your Windows box can sit in the closet. Its, it's yeah. only job is to make sure that the Linux data gets preserved properly. It's just a, it's a, a head. It's just a, it leads to yeah. the cloud. That's yeah. all. Yeah. I, I mean, you can do it on Linux. I mean, I, I, in fact, I, I will promise you this. I will show you a way to get Dropbox and SkyDrive to work on Linux. There are ways. There are workarounds. It's just, it's a, such a pain in the butt. <laughs> it, you know. It's part of the challenge. It, and then the, the other thing is, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work. And I, I, I wasn't able to figure out, like, why did it just stop working? I just have to redo the solution to make it work. Whereas I know if it, if it ends up, if it syncs to the Windows box, the Windows box will sync it to Dropbox and, mm -hmm. and OneDrive. That never fails. And so, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I mean, I... Is this something that we should bring Aaron in on? You should probably bring Aaron on. Okay, this, Aaron yeah. Newcomb or uh, maybe Linux he expert. has a way to do it. But I mean, probably the the thing that always scares me about running those sorts of services on on Linux because those clients really don't work well mm -hmm. with Linux is if it fails once and that was the one time you needed it, you're gonna hate yourself. Yeah, yeah, especially with the that that data, that sensitive data that you want to try and keep. <laughs> gotta, gotta, gotta keep that. Gotta keep that data, son. <laughs> keep that data. Uh, okay. Now, when we come back, we're gonna be talking a little bit about avionics. We're gonna show you how quadcopters actually stay in the air. But before that, here's a quick video on soldering bullets. Bullets. If you're gonna spend any amount of time in the DIY maker arena, you're going to have to learn soldering. In episode 88 of Know How, we had Mark Smitty Smith on the show to give us the finer points of not soldering like a barbarian. While most of us will never have the steady hand and iron skills of Smitty, we can at least learn enough not to completely mess up basic soldering. And Project Quadcopter gives us a fantastic opportunity to practice. Once you get past basic quadcopter kits, you will see bare wires and pads. It's inevitable. And because we'll be swapping out components, because of upgrades and maintenance, it's not always the best idea to directly solder every component to every other. So we use banana connectors. Coming in several sizes, banana or bullet connectors are fantastically efficient, easy to use, and worth their weight in gold when it comes to repairing your gear. Many of the components you buy will have the connectors out of the box, but occasionally you'll have to bust out your iron, and here's how to do it. First, look to your kit. You'll need a soldering iron. I'm using the worst piece of heat in my lab, a 30-watt Radio Shack iron that was at its peak in the 90s, just to show you that you don't need to buy an expensive soldering iron to do it. You'll also want a set of helping hands, articulated arms that can keep wires and components in their proper positions while you're soldering. Get yourself some lead-free rosin core solder, and while you're at it, have a pair of pliers handy. 
Start the process by tinning the wires that you plan to put into the connectors. Heat up the wire, then let the solder flow onto the strands. This is an important step because it will ensure a solid connection once the wires are put into the bullets. Speaking of the bullets, there are a variety of banana plug sizes that you can use, with the most popular being 2 and 3.5 millimeter. The larger the bullet, the more power that you can push through it. Motors for smaller craft tend to use the 2 millimeter bullets, while the larger cans will use 3.5 and 4 millimeter plugs. Once your wires are tinned, place the appropriate bullet into one of your helping hands. There are a few ways to join the wire to the bullet, but my method starts with heating up the bullet until it's hot enough to flow the solder. I place my iron in the connector, then use the side hole to push through a little solder. Quick note, don't use too much. Like me, I always use too much. A little will go a long way. Now switch the position of your iron to pass heat into the solder through the solder plug. This will keep the solder hot and fluid. Essentially, what you've just done is to create a little solder pot. Using a pair of pliers, move your wire into the solder pot and allow the heat to melt the solder on the wire from the tinning. A good way to know if everything is fluid is to look at the junction between the solder in the plug and the wire. If it looks like there's a break, it needs more time. Once you're satisfied that everything is fluid, position the wire where you want it and remove heat. In a few seconds, the solder should cool enough to become solid. You now have a solid bond between the wire and the banana plug bullet, but you're going to need to insulate the assembly to keep it from shorting out. Cut a length of heat shrink tubing, place it over the bullet and wire, then use a heat source to seal and insulate. Rinse, repeat, and take pride in your soldering skills. <laughs> uh, we should probably reiterate, Yes. that's yes. not the iron I always use. I have a very nice no. Weller You digital. just wanted to make a point. I made you, a point, yeah. You could use that. You could, and it, it, people are saying, oh gosh, something's right. wrong with your tip. It's no. disgusting. The iron is horrible. <laughs> it's a 25-year-old <laughs> iron. It is horrible. It's bad, but... Yeah. You know, if, if you do it right, you don't need to buy a super expensive piece of gear. Right. I love my Weller station. My Weller is fantastic. Right. I use it for everything, especially for the fine work. Mm -hmm. That tip has been cleaned and chipped so many times. You can see that carbonized film just forms every time I turn it on. <laughs> it it's, was kind of gross. Yeah. It's very gross. Smitty would cry. <laughs> right. Smitty yeah. would cry a lot. Somewhere out there, there's a Smitty just tearing <laughs> up. <laughs> it's, that, it's like that old commercial. There's the the. Native American looking at what we do to the land <laughs> and a single tear rolls down. Yes, I, the Alex, go thing. to my single. <laughs> there we go, exactly. That's Smitty there, using yeah. my iron. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, uh, here's the thing. The kit, the basic kit that we're going to assemble, it's all non-solder. So it's, mm -hmm. just, it's all bullet connectors, pre-soldered, which is yeah. nice. But when you start getting a bit more advanced, like all of these uh, ESCs from Ready to Fly, yeah. these all were bare wire and bare pad. So you have to learn to solder at least a little bit. And uh, there are people in the, in the chat room who are saying, you know what, it, even if you're good at soldering, if you stop soldering, you forget it. And that's so true. It's a skill. You got to practice it once in a while just to make sure you, you can still do it. Yeah, yeah. And then <laughs> I just recently sat down on a project. And if you don't have all the right tools when oh, you want to do it, it gets bad. really frustrating. It gets bad. <laughs> you end up with like blobs of solder everywhere. Like, just <sighs> put it on there. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'll tease it a little bit, but I was doing the antenna extension for our, our controller, mm -hmm. and the wire that I was working with was itty, itty, itty wire. Itty, 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 itty. And fortunately, I was using uh, Burke's really nice uh, soldering kit, but like, it was tough. It's, it yeah. was tough. I had to practice a little yeah. bit before I actually did anything to the board. And you make fun of people who have like the magnifying glass on their helping hands, but then you're like, I really want a magnifying glass I, right now. Are you, when you're looking at wires that are yeah. About they look like a hair. They look yeah. about a hair on your head, kind yeah. of. And and you got Burke saying, no, no, you don't want to solder that one. You want to solder the insulation. And you're like, <laughs> it's the same thing. What are you talking <laughs> yeah, about? Exactly. And, no. But you know what it is. You what? gotta have the, the right, right tools. tools. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's what we're all about here on Know How. You gotta have the right tools. You could use something that you find in a tool drawer and somewhere. It makes it so much more frustrating. It makes it more frustrating and it just makes it so much more work, which is why Know How is always proud to have as one of its sponsors iFixit. Fix it. You can fix it and iFixit mm -hmm. can help. Now, what is iFixit? iFixit isn't just a collection of tools, they're a collection of knowledge. They give you ready repair manuals for everything from your electronics to your appliances to your clothing. Now, iFixit is a one-stop shop for knowledge about how to fix everything in your electronic life. 
Now, from teardowns of their iPhone 6 and other gadgets, you will fall in love with their line of professional electronics tools built off of that knowledge. iFixit's tools are designed by the teardown engineers who have torn apart hundreds of devices and built thousands of repair guides. They know what it takes to work on gadgets, and this holiday season, they want to arm you and everyone on your gift list with all the tools you'll need to tackle any electronics repair project or hack. iFixit offers the perfect one-two punch, the ProTech Toolkit, and the Magnetic Project Mat. This is, this is actually my personal favorite because this one's been customized for me. It's a good way to make sure that as you disassemble things, uh, your project screws don't end up everywhere. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's also a fantastic way to label things so you know where everything should go when you put it back together. Now, the, uh, the uh, iFixit Toolkit is available right now. It's 70 tools to assist you with any mod, malfunction, or misfortune. Uh, it's got the gold standard for electronics work used by garage hackers and the FBI. More importantly, their unique tools are used by repair technicians everywhere. It includes iFixit's 54-bit driver kit with 54 standard specialty and security bits, a swivel top precision driver, flex extension for hard to reach screws like stereo equipment or PC towers or quadcopters, ESD safe precision tweezers for delicate manipulation, Nylon spudgers, metal spudgers, and plastic opening tools for prying, scraping, and opening tablets, phones, whatever it might be. It's lightweight, compact, and it has a durable tool roll that makes it the on-the-go choice for repair professionals and amateurs alike. Hobbyists and home DIY fixers also use the ProTech Toolkit for doorknobs, eyeglasses, cabinet doors, sink fixtures, and more. Right now, iFixit is offering both of these, both the toolkit and the magnetic pad for $74.95. Now... You can fix it, and iFixit can help. It sure helps us. Go ahead and try iFixit this holiday season. They've got something for every DIY hacker and geek on your list. Head over to iFixit.com slash twit to check out their holiday deals, including the ProTech Toolkit and Magnetic Mat Bundle for only $74.95. And when you enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout, you'll save $10 off any purchase of $50 or more. So it's $64.95. That's iFixit.com slash twit and use the code KNOWHOW, ifixit.com slash twit, and use the code KNOWHOW. And we thank iFixit for their support of KNOWHOW. The part, the, I just uh, took apart the trainer drone that we had, mm -hmm. and it does, the nice thing about it is it does come with a screwdriver yeah. that you can use to take everything apart, but these have like magnetic tips, and it makes it so just, you can just, yeah, pull the little screwdriver. No, no, what I like to do is use screwdrivers that are way too big so it strips the head, <sighs> and then I like to have to dump the chassis upside down to force all the screws And then out. watch them all fall That's on the ground. That's always the best way to do it. <laughs> you could do it that way. I don't With this, the amount of things that we take apart, it, it saves so much time having right. the little magnetic yeah. tips. And for us, this is not just a luxury. I mean, we use it. I stash the them. Time. I yeah. hide them like in different places in the studio. Taking them. Mm -hmm. I know. Before Debbie gave me this one, she's like, I need your old one back. I'm like, someone <laughs> took my old one. <laughs> it was probably me, actually. <laughs> Because I, I like store them under my desk. Appreciate that, bro. Thanks. Yeah. No, <laughs> you know where to great. find them. They're in the no hole. All right, let's talk a little bit about avionics because cool. this is what's going to keep our quadcopters in the air. You yes. need to know how your quadcopter stays in the air so that you can design it properly. And it's some pretty advanced stuff on these little tiny boards. Little teeny tiny boards. Now let's let's look at the summary first of all. Let's see if I can. Oh, no, I have to do it this way. So this this is what the avionics package looks like. I'm, There's I'm a sorry. bunch of Tie Fighters on there. Those are motors, are they, man. <laughs> See, they're labeled. They say motors. Motors? They're yeah. motors. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry about this because Greg is not here today and he normally does all our artwork. Yes. Uh, so you've got your four motors mm -hmm. uh, and they are in specific positions. On most quadcopters, you're going to find, so this is looking at the front and this is the back, right? right? This is motor one, motor two, motor three, motor four. Okay. Okay. So They it, go clockwise? They go clockwise uh, unless, the, unless the instructions tell you otherwise <laughs> for those weird controllers. But this okay. is important because the controller needs to to know which motor is on what corner so that it knows where to increase and decrease thrust to keep this level. Okay. Okay. So from the motors, you're going to go to these things. These are the ESCs. We talked about this in the feedback, mm -hmm. right? So this is a different brand. This is Afro. I bought these from Hobby King. Uh, the motors connect to the ESCs, and the ESCs provide power to the motors. Right. Uh, now, the ESCs are connected to the battery, so that's how they get power to the motor, but they also need to know how much power to supply to the motor. Anywhere between zero and 100%. Zero and 100%, which is why the ESCs are connected to this, the flight controller. This is the brains of the ship. It does not fly without the flight controller. Because <laughs> uh, what the flight the controller will do is it will actually keep everything level. 
Right, because that's what has all the sensors on it. Right, so it's got it's got a magnetometer, it's got gyros, it's got an axis stabilizer, mm -hmm. so that it knows if I start dipping on this side, I want to increase thrust on motor three right. to get it back up to level. Right, so and it does that all on the fly, so when it's fighting the wind, you can see it kind of go... Right, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about the, yeah. how those settings uh, change. And then, of course, you've got the receiver. The receiver goes into the flight controller mm -hmm. so that you can actually get input from your transmitter into your quad. So this is what the general setup looks like. If right. you're going to be setting up your quad, you're going to be setting up this. There are no exceptions. You can add things to the flight controller like uh, GPS and navigation, mm -hmm. but it's still going to look like this. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the setups we've got here on the table. Uh, this is what a, a typical flight controller. This is this is uh, one of my favorite for, uh, go to the extreme close-up, uh, for uh, new flyers. This is, oh, there we go. This is actually a really good option. Do it that way, so it's straight up. Uh, this is called the KK board. You can find these all over the internet. This is a KK 2.15. Uh, let me go ahead and give power to this so that you can actually see what it looks like unlimited when I... Unlimited power. Unlimited power. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I need a battery. So when I turn this thing on, it's going to look like this. Boop, boop, boop. Okay. Look at that little guy. Now, inside this menu, I have the ability to set pretty much everything. So from how much stick it's going to get from the receiver to, for example, uh, this one's important. Where is that? Show motor settings. Uh, da, 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 da. There we go. So this is actually going to show you what kind of quadcopter this controller has been set for. That's cool. Right. So it's telling you motor 1, motor 2, motor 3, motor 4. But I could load a bunch of different settings. It's actually possible to set this thing up so that it's an X-copter, a single helicopter, a, a, a counter-rotating helicopter, an octocopter, a septocopter. So when you load those layouts, the screen will actually tell you where you need to wire the ESCs in order to make it possible for the controller to control it. That is really cool. And how much does this this board cost? It's like 20 bucks. Wow. 20 30. Dollars. Yeah, these are not expensive. This is this is an, the one that I would recommend mm -hmm. for crazy crazy beginners. Like you've never done anything before, this is great because all of the instructions are on the screen. Right. You uh, can thumb through the menu system. Is there at any point that you need to hook it up to a computer to like nope. update software nope. or anything? This like thing's that? ready. I mean, you could. You yeah. uh, you couldn't you can actually plug this into a, a USB adapter to upgrade the firmware. Mm -hmm. But assuming that you've got the two, the KK 2.15 or the KK 2.1 mm -hmm. uh, it's the software is going to work fine. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, and there are a couple of things. There's one thing I want to show you here uh, really quickly. If we go to the self-leveling, uh, it's actually easier to see it over here. If we go to the, the self-leveling, uh, there we go, settings, right here, this is actually very important for beginners because that, especially that P number, that P number, the P gain, oh. that's telling the controller how much input it can it can give to stabilize the ship. Okay. So uh, and we'll see that when we get to this part of the of the qu project quadcopter, I'm going to show you what happens when you have your P level set way too high, right? And when it's set way too low. Typically, if it's set way too high, you're going to get oscillation, twitchy, right? Because it's going to correct this way, it's going to overcorrect, correct that way. So it just right. ends up fighting with itself all right. the time, and your quadcopter will will just look horrible. If you set it too low, what will happen is you'll have like lazy rolls <laughs> where you'll start to flip over and then maybe it's just kind of fighting back a little bit. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So you got to kind of dial it in depending on your preferences? Or? Exactly. And what I have on mine is I actually, I have one of my switches tied to turn off the uh, the self stabilizer. So you go full manual? Full is manual, that? right. <laughs> uh, which means it's no longer helping you at all. You've got to keep it level. Uh, which which is good. We're gonna when we when we do the first flight episode, we're gonna show mm -hmm. people why they want to be able to do that. Uh, I mean, I can think of a few reasons, but okay, yeah. okay, cool. Now this is super simple. This is super basic. Uh, let me show you something that's a little bit different. This is a, a MWC. This is a flip controller. Let's go to the extreme close up. Uh, this thing is also from Ready to Fly Quads. Alex, I think you have a link for this. Uh, this is a this is a more advanced flight controller. You can see it's a lot smaller. It's actually an Arduino Uno in what? there, right? And it's been programmed from uh, from by Paul Baxter from Ready to Fly Quads to do everything that you want it to do. It, uh, now go back to notice it doesn't have the screen, right? Yeah. So obviously it's going to be a bit more difficult for you to tune. Right. So you have to have it plugged into your laptop or something like yes. that. Yes. 
or you can actually have this one connected to like your Android phone, which is kind of nice. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say that this is a beginner board, but it it's uh, it's, it's pretty cool. easy. If you go to my go and go to my laptop, go to this one, the 720p. This is actually the telemetry it's getting. This is the cool stuff. This I saw you is playing the cool with. stuff, right? So it it knows like right now. So if I'm flying my quadcopter, typically. I'm uh I'm like right here. You already right? level, yeah. And then when you're flying, it's like oh pull no. up, pull oh, up. Oh, Hippo, you're stalling. Hippo, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and then dead, right? Right. And uh, straight but, into the ground. Yeah. You know, the nice thing about this kind of software is you can actually, if you have like the nav setting, you can plan out missions. That is. Uh, cool. Where your quad's gonna go. You can look at flight tuning. You can basically configure everything you want to configure about how this thing is going oh, to look, work. Oh, look, you can see the numbers rolling there. Oh, yeah. it has a little graph. It's a telemetry system. And the, the nice thing about this is I can actually hook up a wireless transmitter to this so it sends me real-time telemetry from my, from my quad as well as data. So afterwards, oh. I can go... Uh, I, I can look at this and say, okay, you know, I went here and then I went here, I went here, and it, it'll actually show the path of my quad. That is so cool. I want to use this for more than just quads. I want to do a bunch well, of other stuff. Well, that's that. the thing. This is a it's a it's a Arduino, so you can reprogram this at will. Uh, people have used this to. Do you hear a plane flying around? I know. Is there a plane coming in? Is that me? Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think we blew something up. Actually, F F fourteens <laughs> used to use these in order to launch off of carrier decks. No, I can't. <laughs> yeah, I was a, like, wait, uh, a uh, wait one second. <laughs> hold on, hold he's on. He's saying it in a voice that I feel like <laughs> he's telling the truth, but he's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, this is, uh, and, and this is a $15 board. That is so cool. So it's crazy, crazy cheap. And and the nice thing about if you buy it from uh, Paul Baxter, he goes mm -hmm. by the name of White Spy White over Spy. at Ready to Fly Quads. Yeah. You actually, he, you can tell him what kind of settings you want. Like, are you a beginner? He'll yeah. set it up so that you never have to plug it in. Just just plug in the uh, the receiver yeah. and the and the electronic speed controllers and you're ready to go. I, I want this for like my motorcycle and have like a black box that, that gives me all the data from that. I mean, would it be awesome to get this kind of telemetry? Yeah. Like how fast you were going. What was when your you lean level? angle? Yeah, what yeah. was your lean? Yeah. And you go, oh, yeah, and you, I'm sure that you're, most of the time you're going to go, I thought I was leaning a lot more than that. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was like a like two it. degrees, right? <laughs> it felt like I was really leaned over. This thing's like, like, almost at 70 degrees? What? And, <laughs> <laughs> and if there was a video of it, it would be like, oh, he's not leaned I over know. at all. That's, that's when telemetry <laughs> lets you down. Thanks. Uh, thanks, telemetry. Mm -hmm. Oh, but uh, yeah, so this is what an avionics package looks like. Uh, the, the motors, the speed controllers, the battery, the receiver, that's pretty much going to stay the same. Cool. But what will change is what you do with your flight controller. Uh, and this is another reason why we told people that they should probably use bullets instead of soldering bullets. things directly in. Because you will be unplugging and plugging them in a lot. Right. So start with the KK. There's nothing wrong with the KK. I, I'm going to be using the, the KK boards forever. Mm -hmm. But you know what? There's going to be times when I'm going to want to go with something a bit more advanced. And I'm probably going to you know, pull out something like this or the professional version of this, right. which will have things like GPS and navigation. And, and it's will, not that expensive. It's, like, it's not out of the realm of possibility that you're going to swap out these, nope. these controllers. Yeah. Yeah. And it becomes a completely different ship when you change the controllers. Because the KK, its job is to keep the thing level. That's right. what it does. And then you get to that point where you're like, you know what? I don't want it to be level. Well, what I want to do, I think we talked about it a little bit, was uh, FPV. And yeah. then have the uh, the HUD display overlaid, you know, so you, yeah. <laughs> you're flying. That, this will actually do that. This yeah. has another module I've actually got in the bag over here that will, uh, it will take all that telemetry information and it will push it through the video signal that this thing sends out. So along with the picture from the, the front of the quad, you will see at the bottom or the top, like altitude, speed, it'll show you the little horizon. Oh, man. Yeah. That... That makes, you know, that this little excited so feeling yeah. you get in your yeah. gut, like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> Hippo, what are you doing? <laughs> We're out of control. Ah. Uh, but uh, we know that this was a lot of information to take in. Uh, <laughs> oh, see, we I just crashed it, it again. <laughs> this is pretty much what I sound like this every is, This is what's happening. <laughs> oh, no. Pull up. Pull up. Wait, nope. It's no. dead. <laughs> it's like when I go flying with Alex. <laughs> this happens every time. I know, man. That when you die, it's horrible. <laughs> the reset. It's okay. I had another life. I had another guy. Uh, uh, don't forget that you can find out notes. Uh, get all the notes for this. So we'll show you 
exactly how you should be soldering. And we'll give you the links to where you could buy all this gear online. Because if you haven't already, you're probably going to want to get some gear. Because in the next episode, mm -hmm. we're actually doing integration. I'm going to show you how all these parts go together so, so you can actually build yourself a quad. By the way, this is, this is a very cool one. What's uh, a, the board? Or? Uh, this, this frame, that's a 230 nice. class. Half the weight of this, but the motors are twice as powerful. Oh, so, so is this going to be like a race one? That's then? my race one. Nice. It's going, it's going to be no crazy. Wonder you, no wonder you asked if I wanted to play with this one. I'm like, hey, Hippo, you, you want to give me the slow one? Yeah. Oh, such a I'll, no, I'll build, I'll build, you know, we'll race the same ones. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay? Well, then, if you're like us and you've bought the trainer, you've been playing with that, I've kind of hit the ceiling with that one. Yeah. You know, like I've, find, I've dialed in uh, my the fine tuning of the flying of the contraption. I've modified it and now I can't, I want to play with it more, but I've taken it as far as I can. Yeah. And, and you know, that's how it's going to be with, with all the gear. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say use bullets because eventually you're going to get to the point where you're like, you know what? I've mastered these motors. I want to go up a little bit of horsepower. I want, I want, yeah, I want I've to mastered go to the this flight step. controller. I want one that does GPS. Mm -hmm. Or I've, I've mastered this frame. I want one that's really aggressive and will give me a lot of speed, even though right. it's going to be harder to control. Right. Those are all things that you can do without buying an entirely new quad. That's the exciting part about this. It's like geeks with hot rods back in the day where I can swap out so many different parts and it becomes a completely different character. Well, and it seems like uh, the technology is getting better and better really quickly because even with the DJI that we toasted, uh, you were talking about replacing the controller in that with one of these ones, yep. which is $15 and it's <laughs> way better. That one's like $600. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, like, for, and actually, this is a really good example. The DJI, the controller there is built for photography. Right. So it is the most boring flight ever. <laughs> it tries to hold it steady. Yeah. But also, it's so complicated because if the GPS doesn't sync, it freaks out. I hated that about it. These are all turn it on, fly it. Right. Which and is what I wanted. That's what you want. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't forget, you can always get our show notes at mm. twit.tv slash kh. <laughs> right? That's yes, that's where all our episodes live. Uh, you, you'll definitely want to go back and flip through some of the episodes if you missed anything or check some of the show notes. Uh, you can also subscribe to the video if you choose to. There's a lot of different ways uh, to... <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> the screenshot there. I think that's when you like flew the drone into the ground or I something. <laughs> Yeah, that <laughs> happened. I know. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, look at all those show notes. Yeah, look so at all them show notes. Yeah, we have lots. We have yeah, you know, step by step instructions. Really, step by step instructions, links to everything that we talk about because those are definitely a lot of questions that people have. So uh, check out the website there. But that's not the only place you can follow us. No, you can get us on Google Plus. Just go to mm -hmm. uh, G Plus dot. T-O-Slash-Twit-K-H. Yeah. Just go to Google Plus and look for co for a uh, know-how. <laughs> the communities, yeah, yeah. The community. Look for the community. Join it. It's it's uh, 7,600 people or so. We're getting close to 8,000, actually. And they're all experts in their own rights. Everyone knows something. But if you combine as a community, you know everything. Yeah, it's a it's a cool place to thumb through. Actually, and one of the somebody contacted me through it, and they were asking about the NES project again. Yeah. that came back up, and they were like, "Hey, I have a better way of you know hooking up the USBs to the front of go. the NES." I was like, "Yeah, I should have done it like that. That looks way better." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you and and you know what, if you've got any examples of your soldering skills. <laughs> Take a video or a picture, put it up on the community, because we want to show off what people who actually know what they're doing. Yeah, show us your soldering do. iron that doesn't look <laughs> like uh, a little like a, a torture looking, device. When I was editing that together, I'm like, does it really look that bad? That's yeah. horrible. <laughs> it's like I'm soldering with a piece of charcoal. Yeah. Back to the Stone Age of soldering. <laughs> uh, don't forget, you can also find us on Twitter. I'm uh, twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's so. at PadreSJ. And I am cranky underscore hippo. That's at cranky underscore hippo. Yeah, and don't forget that our TD is Alex. Oh, look at that skill. He's at A-N-E-L-F-3 and L-3. Follow him and uh, find out what he's... Oh. He's find just out if he's crashing and burning a lot. Well, yeah. yeah. I think he needs to take his flight test again yeah, soon. He so. needs a nap. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Father Robert Palliser. I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go do it. <laughs>